Hello and welcome to the Modern Adventurer podcast, coming up. Yes, it was great, but then when I came back from them, I was bombarded by it all, especially after the Atlantic Row. So 40 days of no communication like that. And you're just literally talking to your friends on this boat and looking at the sea. For 40 days, you come back and it is absolutely so overwhelming, um, turning your phone back on. My next guest is an eco-adventurer who has done some incredible trips over the years from swimming the length of the English Channel to rowing across the Atlantic. On the podcast today, we talk about some of the issues that have arisen over his time pursuing these adventures, from mental health issues that is what led him into this incredible way of life, and how he speaks on the podcast about the importance of getting outside and into nature. So... I am delighted to introduce Isaac Kenyon to the podcast. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. Very excited to have our discussion. Well, it's an absolute pleasure. And you've you've just done this incredible uh, trip, which has just come out at the Kendall Festival. And I was absolutely fascinated by this sort of process. One, because you went from the Orkney Islands to the Scilly Isles, but also when you see the pictures of you pedaling over water, I was definitely quite intrigued. Before we before we sort of get into that, uh, let's start at the beginning and how you got into this sort of line of work and these adventures. So long time ago, I was at university and I was studying geology. I wanted to be a paleontologist at the time and then my life changed a little bit and I decided that maybe the Jurassic Park inspiration wasn't quite for me as I was doing geology and I got more interested in energy. Uh, and energy things and there was a lot of field trips and there was a lot of work behind screens and a lot of indoor work as well something that I wasn't quite used to so at school you used to have your PE lessons your breaks and that was kind of it you had your one hour lessons at university you got so much coursework to do all the time and I was just indoors all the time and I had a bit of a bit of a quarter life crisis I would call it and where I just started having really bad mental health, really bad, and high levels of anxiety. Um, and I wasn't quite getting to grips with what it was, and I wasn't reaching out for help. Uh, being the guy, you know, we're quite bad at uh, asking for help when we don't feel great. And um, we kind of just tough it on. I have a, quite a tough family like that, just get on with it sort of thing. And it, it just it made things worse. Um, and I started going out um, side um, because my head was racing and I couldn't think properly and just walking in woods and it was kind of my nat- like a bit of natural cure uh, like a prescription from nature for me where I was able to get away from distractions notifications and just be with myself and just hear the birds see some squirrels things like this and it was really really nice and I was doing about 10-15 minute breaks like that all the time and I just got kind of addicted to doing that and if I tie this in now to my sporting achievements, I was always a swimmer and have been a swimmer for a long time. My mother got me into swimming when I was 10 years old into a swimming club because I had such high energy and I'm not a great person to have indoors for too long. I just have to get it out, this energy somehow. And usually it was to do with sports. So I just got thrown in a swimming pool for about 27, 28 hours a week. Um, And then when I got to university, I was stopping my sports because I was doing my coursework because I didn't have time for the sport because I was trying to get these grades and I was stuck indoors and it just was not healthy. Um, So I was swimming maybe two or three times a week and I got to a stage where I was just like, I just need to I just need to combine these outdoor breaks and sports together and outdoor adventuring, outdoor sports came from that really a bit of a realization that it was needed for my mental mental health. Uh, the first adventure that I did was swimming the English Channel. And I did it in a relay, so it wasn't just me on my own. But this was a massive step for me because it was the first time where I had that immersive feeling of nature, where it was pushing my boundaries mentally, physically, and immersing myself in an environment that was unnatural to me. I've been in a swimming pool for so many years. And when I signed up to swim the English Channel, it was a team that I led. 
in, instigated it all saying all of us had never really done anything like this before and i just got this team together to just let's try and and uh push push our boundaries and see see if we can do something great uh with our swimming so we're all swimmers why don't we try and do the english channel swim march came um when we decided it was march and we decided to do it that june and we had the funds the university would back us so we got funding from the university to do it and our first training session was down in a lake just outside of um university and i went on line trying to find lakes or places open water places to swim at and i didn't really know much um i ended up going on this <laughs> bit of a, like i think it was a nudist website <laughs> of where you can go to swim quietly naked <laughs> and no one will find you but it's for free right so as students we were so stingy we're looking for a free place to swim so i i, I went um and took everyone down this sort of <laughs> This directions that this nu- a nudist had put. <laughs> Hopefully they weren't there. But we, when we got there, um, it was our first swim, and it was in March. Jumped in, naively thought the website on the English Channel says do two hours, and you should be fit enough to do it. We thought, well, two hours of swimming, that's fine. We're all pool swimmers, we can do that. It was freezing. It just completely shocked us. We were nowhere near prepared for this, and we all came out in a really bad way a bad state and that kind of opened my eyes to wow there is a whole new world out there and it's dangerous at times <laughs> and it kind of felt real and i felt like i've really hit something that maybe i can't do or something like this so i got drawn to it and um from that point it really helped me throughout my university years to have a focus and get myself away from the screens so i was using the training as a way to do that uh, and then the english channels to do that and then it, I guess this outdoor adventure lifestyle has come from that bug of pushing my boundaries, getting used to the challenge, getting used to doing things outdoors. And it felt really healthy and natural because you're you're in nature. It, on the water line, it's amazing because you can see special creatures and biodiversity that you don't usually get to see. And it's just very peaceful. The water is just splashes of water. It's very good for mental health. And um, yeah, I've, I had that sort of balance from that. And I also found in those states when I was doing a challenge like the English Channel, which led to other things I'll go on, I was in a state of consciousness and mind where I was just thinking about nature and mindfulness. It was just pretty much just took my mind away from everything, cleared everything out, like just all this junk that was in my head. And I get they call it flow. It's like scientists and things call it flow. I, I talk about it in my TED talk. Um, and it's this this thing where my performance increases as well. I feel like I'm on top of my game. I also feel really happy and I'm just just enjoying the moment sort of thing. And I'm not thinking about anything else, just being there. And I don't get it anywhere else, just in these sort of outdoors places and challenges and, you know, hikes sometimes. But I don't seem to get it when I'm on screens or, or I wouldn't definitely not get it if I was in this podcast right now. So, um yeah, so it was yeah, it was right interesting. And um, that's how it all began really, jumping into the water and then immersing myself. And then from there I, I got the bug and thought, okay, let's try a big hike and I climbed a mountain, my first mountain was Mount Kilimanjaro. And that was pretty amazing. I look back on it now and um if I was to do it differently, I would do it unsupported without Sherpas. Um just to add that element of sort of off your own steam. Um, and then after that, I signed up to row across the Atlantic Ocean, which was a really big step. That was where I think you have to really love outdoor challenges and things if you're going to sign up to do something like that. <laughs> it was absolutely m- massive for me. Huge step. Um, 40 days out at sea um, in a tiny little rowing boat in a team of four. Uh, the two hours on, two hours off was quite quite something to adjust to. But the... Um, Two hours on, two hours off was two hours of rowing and two hours of body maintenance for feeding yourself, navigation, all of these things. And it was, and sleep as well. You had to try and find sleep. And that that was where I think it all started. The swim and then going through different journeys. And then uh, once I was on the Atlantic, I actually realized a, a bit more clearer purpose. And that's what's led to this latest adventure, which is, I would say it's the culmination of finding my true ambitions and what I really want to do in life. 
Um, so it's taken a long time to get there. But I feel like I'm finally there. And the outdoor challenges was are, are just journeys that take me through sort of a, fo- a thinking process. And, and now I feel like I know what, where I'm at. It took a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I don't know where to sort of begin with that. I mean, what's the sort of time frame from your first challenge swimming to where we are now? Um, so the first challenge I did swimming was when I was 20, 21, 21. So about six, six years, six, six years. seven years. Yeah. So I've done a few things in, in those years. Good. And uh, I suppose if starting from going back to the swimming, jumping into that lake for the first time, and that sort of really hit home about open water swimming, swimming in the cold, because you swam the English Channel without a wetsuit. Yeah, 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 without a wetsuit. That was that was the um, the added layer of, of challenge there. Um, that you, was quite cold. <laughs> did, you, did you rub yourself in goose fat? Is, uh yeah so when i first researched it there was a lot of discussions that will keep you warm or it just helps reduce the salt friction i did run myself in goose fat and it didn't keep me warm it just reduced the salt friction <laughs> so I, after that i went i went back on the blog and i was like it doesn't keep you warm <laughs> this is a myth <laughs> yeah <laughs> And uh, so, I mean, like that, that trip sort of propelled you into, as you sort of say, taking your time from a sort of dark place, as you said, at university where you were struggling mentally to sort of, I don't know, stare at screens to sort of loss of concentration. I think everyone listening can sort of relate to that. You're on your screen and then suddenly 20 minutes goes and suddenly you forget what you were actually just about to do. And I think even now it's probably almost getting worse and worse. And is that the sort of motivation that you've had over these past years? Is that with these challenges, it's the only time you feel yourself getting into these states of flow, as you call it, this sort of moment of total consciousness? Yeah, they, these challenges, they are, they are for me, some of the best times where I can really escape um, or as I've gotten better at understanding my needs I, I've noticed that I, you know, I just needed to be away from technology for extended periods of time and I feel a lot better um, but I know that's not impossible that's pretty impossible in society to do that cut yourself off from everybody unless you become a hermit or something so that's not like for me, that's not like quite ideal. Um, so what I do is I try to break up my days uh, with training, which revolves around no technology, nothing like that, getting away from it uh, and getting that state of balance. Because I found a lot of it is a build up. So it builds itself up. So I, I, I suffer from like panic disorder and anxiety, which is basically I create all these arbitrary worries in my head and then I start panicking about them. Um, but a way I can reduce all these worries and these stresses is by reducing the st- stresses around me and constant notifications, always online interacting and things like this. This just adds another layer, a huge layer of stress on people. Emails, having to respond to emails instantly because... There is no excuse, if that makes sense, because it's all instant communication nowadays. So you, if you if you avoid it, you always know it's there. Once you've seen it, you know it's there. It's like to, it's like being in a room with somebody, and they're talking to you, and you're just trying to not say anything and ignore them, but you you can't if they're talking to you. That's how it feels like with emails and these things. So it's just an added layer of stress that I just try to break free from. And I just find a couple hours here, a couple hours there. It breaks it all up and makes it a lot easier. Um, looking at TV screens, it's all like really so much. And uh, it just opened my eyes to that. I need a balance and I need a purpose like this, which is really important. And then I was thinking even deeper as to what really do I like and what do I need in life? 
when I was on that boat because you have so much time to think to think about things. And I realized that if you took nature away and we started being just in a concrete jungle everywhere, what would happen to my mental health? So we're going down a, a route now of so much more technology than ever before. So much more human intervention and activity in green spaces, outdoor spaces, blue spaces. So much more infrastructure, so much more population, bigger towns. Less and less wild open spaces. Where does one go to clear their head? How does one clear their head? I mean, there's, me there's meditation, but I don't think meditation in London works very well when you've got all the cars and beeping and the traffic. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's a... Uh, that's where I st that's where the next adventure really came in in the the big why it was like I was like we have to preserve these spaces they're so important for physical and mental health um and that, that's where the pedal for parts came from I think I went off on the tangent there and led to something else but um I hope that was a good answer <laughs> <laughs> no I, I I completely agree with you I I studied landscape architecture and I remember when we were designing a hospital just a sort of place where patients can go. And originally it was sort of designed in a more sort of plastic planting and everything, but studies were sort of shown that when people interact with nature in itself, real trees, real plants, that they get better a lot quicker. And I think I remember seeing that, you know, the human eye sees more shades of green than any other color because we were originally through evolution were in and amongst the forest the grasslands everywhere and so to take that away in such in a relatively short part in a relatively short space of time in comparison to our evolution it's going to do huge effects on the mental health of human beings yeah we're designed aren't we to be communicative interactive creatures um movement movement was a big thing when we were migrate migrating we we n never used to stay in one place this is something that we've uh, like made ourselves having a home and just staying in one place that wasn't a thing we we do need to keep moving and and that's why there's all this this thing about the travel bug all these people were, like traveling all the time is they're just feeding their in a in a chimp i guess or in a in a, in a person who just needs to keep moving uh, it's just a natural thing that we do. Um, and and that's actually quite difficult because nowadays, I mean, last week we had Pip Stewart on and she, we were talking about sustainable travel. And of course, with people are now saying, well, we shouldn't be traveling as much with, with globalization. Again, it's going against human instinct to sort of move. And the idea of saying, oh, well, you can't travel uh there because of this or that where do you stop it is it well you can't really leave your city you can't leave your country you can't leave your uh continent you can't leave this it's sort of where where is the line and having a sort of travel podcast i'm more encouraging people to venture out and explore but of course with that comes its challenges through plane travel yeah, plane travel. The uh, the only solution I see right now is changing the way we fuel planes and changing the way we build planes to be sustainable. Um, right now, there's carbon offsetting which you can do. Uh, anyone can carbon offset their travel, but that feels a bit like a, a bit like a cop out a bit. Um, but also, how else do you get from one country to another? Um, but that was that is a bit of a luxury. Years and years ago, we never used to do that. I used to. <laughs> row <laughs> I think some people <laughs> rowed um, but yeah sustainable travel is such an interesting uh, question that's where we're going with our project next um, how do we how do we get from places A to B in the most sustainable way what solutions are there what climate solutions are there right now um, what can we do um, to speed up the way we change our travel things like incentives and Gov governmental work streams what, what what can piece things together so that we can have a scaled up solution um so there are there's loads of different ways of sustainable travel right now but a lot of them are a bit far-fetched some of them are quite difficult 
physically. <laughs> you know, you're asking some some people, oh, we should cycle everywhere, but you're going to ask an older, you know, 70, 80 year old to cycle on a bamboo bike or something like this. Not going to happen. Not going to so happen. Ha- yeah, so how we, we need to think of different ways we can we can do that. More public transport. There's gr- that's a great idea, but then you need to think about how we're going to not disrupt the environment as we build these massive railways or build these huge scale infrastructure projects for allowing public transport. So there's a there's a lot to to think about. There's a lot of compromises that need to be made and with that takes a lot of courage. Um, and I think for us to move forward in the sustainable travel, we're going to have to take some risks. I know we're going to have to make some mistakes, but that's how we always learn. I mean, if you don't make a mistake, you're not learning anything, are you, really? <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of people learn them, learn inventions and make some incredible things from the first mistakes they made. The, on- the only thing is, can we make mistakes that aren't going to detriment us and the environment so badly that it's irreversible because currently we are making a huge irreversible change um so i feel like any form of courage of doing something differently can't be as bad as the trajectory we're going on down now anyway so let's experiment and try new things what uh, trajectory are you sort of referring to so in climate change right now our trajectory is um currently on course for being a bit too to uh, us versus nature and we're going to win which we have been for the last 100 200 years so we we need to do is kind of change our trajectory to be in partnership with nature or co-inhabitants rather than us versus nature so it'd be really nice to to see if we can start change changing our society to be with not next to or against and the way we do that is everything that we do, our sustainable travel, the way we live, the way we interact, the way we expand as a population, what we consume, everything needs to be in cohabitants and fair, equal, if we can. Um, it, that's, that's, that's the trajectory that I have in mind. <laughs> um, I wonder if anyone else agrees with that. I hope they do. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that, that's what I was getting at. Are you sort of referring to the sort of term biomimicry? Oh, that's a cool term. I've not heard of that one before. <laughs> Can you explain that one a bit? Uh, biomimicry is where you design based upon nature. And so, oh, yeah. And so you copy nature's way of design into how you design things. Let's think, say yeah. ar- ar- architecture and the landscape are sort of w- as one rather than a building and a garden let's say it's yeah. almost the garden and the building in and amongst one another yeah that's definitely one aspect and then also regeneration as well so re- regenerate generating so as we create food for ourselves we also we take a lot from the planet to do that so how can we regenerate the foods for everyone else for, for the rest of biodiversity not just us and how can we reduce the space of the amount of food that we need so that take when we cr- grow our food it takes up a lot of space on the planet how can we reduce that and things just being a bit more with nature in that sense so we every everything we do we do take at the moment um, most of it so how can we do everything so that's a bit more of a give and take well that probably moves sort of nicely on to your recent um pedal for parks trip which you went from the Auckland Islands to the Scilly Isles. Yeah, yeah. How how did this adventure start? So on the Atlantic, as I said, I had lots of time just thinking about what mattered and green spaces was really important at that time because I was thinking about... It was very selfish. It came from a selfish... I would like mental health, uh, health support and nature is how I get it. I want to protect nature. Um, and then I started thinking unselfishly and thinking about well, I can't be the only one who thinks like this. There's got to be others. So I started asking people and everyone was saying it's so important for themselves too. And then I realized this is a big societal change that we need. Uh, we need to start thinking differently, behavior change. And I think the whole idea was to protect and preserve our green spaces in the UK because 
the concept of telling people this is how it should be done and not doing it yourself is a bit hypocritical. <laughs> I started researching um, green spaces and outdoor spaces in the UK and how it's changed, how does the landscape changed, how how has our biodiversity changed, and I found some horrific facts that I just n not really mentioned too much. Um, I'll mention some now. They are quite staggering, but we are one of the least biodiverse places in the planet. On the planet, sorry. And that UK. was a massive shock. Yeah, UK is so not biodiverse. It used to be very biodiverse. It's not anymore. It's one of the worst. And 100 to 150 years ago, 80% of the UK was forest. It now stands as 20%. So in 100 years... We've lost 60% forest. Half of the UK was forest, and half is gone. Like, that was staggering. And I was, I was really, really kind of, wow, the pace. The pace is fast. So in my lifetime, if we continue this pace, could all forest be gone? <laughs> I, th I think there's a turning point, though, happening where it's sort of probably like population growth where it's going to sort of peak in 2040 and then drop off very quickly as more um, developing countries sort of become more urbanized, more or less and less people will be having children. I think it's the same in, a, in respect to how people are sort of adopting with forestry. I think the UK is looking at planting, I don't know, a million trees or something in the next 10 years. One yeah. Hope. Yeah, they are, well, they are. They there was a tree planting scheme 15, 20 years ago, where they massive government scheme to plant trees, and they didn't manage the trees, so a lot of them have died. So there was millions and millions of pounds spent, hundreds and hundreds of man hours spent, and these trees are all died because no one managed them, them from a like inception sapling up. So we are uh, well, that, that's just another thing, but we we have reacted to these facts. That's the main thing. So, yes, yeah, 60% has been lost. Staggering fact. One of the things that made me really want to, to do something for Green Space and National Parks, talk about restoration, how can we scale these things up. Um, but we still haven't obviously done the actions yet properly because the results are still still the same. We're still, de still depleting. So until it starts reversing, then, then you know the job is done. Um, so we had... Uh, I guess a, an idea well I had an idea to do that on the Atlantic Road to do some sort of big green initiative of such like a, a, an adventure that had a bit more meaning behind it a bit more purpose behind it um, to do with green spaces mental health um, that was the start and then a friend of mine wanted to do a, a challenge and I was basically at this point I was kind of drawing up plans maybe we'll do a cycle and see all these environmental projects and he wanted to do a cycle so then he joined um based on that just the adventure part and then another friend of mine alex in the team he joined just pretty much very soon afterwards on the concept of mental health was really important for um outdoors and nature was very important for his mental health and he wanted to do something to preserve and protect it and highlight the projects and actions that people can get involved in to do that so that was kind of the inception really at that point and then we devised a route to connect as many projects as possible which we re researched um that were trying to make changes or shift the way we do things and we just called them climate solutions for now they're just solutions to to um, improve our sustainability in, in the uk and that that's that's where it all, it all came about and the route was from the Orkney Islands um, in Bursay, the northwest point. And then we cycled to the Isles of Scilly. And the reason why we had the islands included is because they're quite interesting um, places to be for various different sustainability and circular economy um, discussions. So in Orkney, it's one of the best places for experimenting with new energy types wind and solar incredible wind resource incredible sea tidal resource there 
And also it's a place where pretty much most of all forest has gone and they have, I think, 0.01% forest left compared to what it used to be like. Uh, and that's been a lot to do with agricultural land and, and, and a big population. So that was an interesting place to include. And then the other, the Isles of Scilly, have a, a really interesting organic farming approach and way of circular living where they're producing their own food and produce trying to produce their own electricity for the island to be self-sufficient so it's like a i guess an almost an off-grid island from the uk and it's how what they're doing there how could that be scaled up across the uk is that possible and so those were two islands and then we connected those islands with a bit of adventure um bit of bit of exciting uh water bikes um they are really interesting devices. They're just spinning bikes on floats and they've got a propeller that's attached to a belt drive chain and you can go about three to f three to three knots or so across water. They're not very stable, so you do need really good conditions, but we, we use that as a way to get across to try and keep it as a sustainable journey from just cycling all the way through. And then we had loads of different climate solutions on mainland UK. We visited six national parks out of the 15 and um, we had two weeks only to do this project because to do the sea crossings on water bikes there's a neap tide which is a really low tide where the tide is not, not that strong and you need, you do need that because these bikes would definitely not make it on a high tide or a strong tide and what the first top one up in Orkney is called the Penton Firth that that stretch of crossing has a tide of 15 miles per hour at times so that that really you really need to go on the right right day for that and the right time and the neap tides were really important and the neap tides were two weeks roughly between each other from the one in the north which was the Orkney crossing to the one in the south from Land's End to the Isles of Scilly so there wasn't a lot of time on land to get there so there was a bit of a time frame to get to to um, Land's End and we did it ours in tw twelve days and. Um, so yeah, that was the why. The why was let's highlight climate solutions to try and improve and give them a bit of a raised profile against the negative noise that was coming on with climate change and drive people to support those projects so that we can grow as a as a, a society in a in a sustainable way and um that will help everyone's physical and mental health. Um that yeah, that was it. <laughs> Well, I think for people listening, because this was then made into a documentary that's just come out at Kendall Mountain Festival. And I suppose for people who are interested, how did the sort of sponsorship go? Yeah, the sponsorship was very tough. And um, so if, if you think about the duration of the project happened 2019 to 2020 when the pandemic struck um so all of the the whole project needed to be self-funded we didn't have um big backers or anything like that so what we needed to do was get people aligned with what we were trying to achieve here so brands and um some some sort of organizations and things to see if they would sponsor us money to 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 produce a film like this and be part of this project um and it was quite hard at the start because marketing budgets were just getting cut left, right and centre because people just had no idea. Even if they had staff next year, um, what was happening, COVID was just wrecking everyone's finances. And it, it, we were asking people for money at that time. And I mean, that's that's a really hard time to ask people for money. Um, but we did manage to convince and uh, get people involved in our project that this really needed thing. The pandemic, as we all know, has opened people's eyes to how important outdoor spaces have been, like people being locked inside doing lockdown. Outdoor space has been so important for them to escape. So I think that resonated a lot. And that's one of the main messaging of our film is that, you know, we're highlighting these climate solutions. We're doing this hard adventure. We're cycling to meet all these people to highlight what they're doing, which are incredible things that can help preserve and protect and regenerate these green spaces, which are important, not just for biodiversity, but for you as people, you know, mental health and physical health is so important. So, yeah, we managed to get 
some convinced and then eventually momentum built built from there it was quite hard of course um even getting the film crew involved because obviously they had no idea if this would go ahead because they might not want to get involved because there's uh, no funding or because of covid things cancelling so it was quite a difficult project to manage um alongside full-time work so it was uh <laughs> one hell of a journey so if anyone needs sponsorship <laughs> tips or whatever um i've got i've got a few uh one of which is make sure you're very clear on your why and make sure that your why aligns with other people's why before you ask them for money like if they're if if this is a brand and they're doing something completely different to what you're doing uh and they've they've been focused on that it's highly unlikely they're not going to support you um so don't get like that rejection and take it on board it's probably because you weren't aligned so think about people who are aligned with you and and your mission your goals and also um persistence as well when with sponsorships just like sales pretty much um in businesses right person right time right moment and you can only be right person right time right moment by taking the action to 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 reach out sometimes sometimes you get organic stuff people find out about you and they oh i'd love to back you i heard about you from this but at, at most of the time it's at, when you're starting a project from scratch like this it's it's very much you're reaching out and how in terms of preparing training was there much done for it or was it more on the uh, sponsorship way started off a lot heavily on sponsorship because you're thinking do i need to get myself physically fit for this if it's not going to go ahead so there's a lot of that um but i i was very much with the team saying just be ready let's just let's just go with it so the first time we tried to do the trip was cancelled because we didn't get the funding in place in time so then we pushed it back um and covid also at the same time struck where you weren't allowed to move between counties at that point we had all trained for it and we were all physically fit and then suddenly we got to wait another eight months will it happen you start having those doubts so what i was just trying to get the team to do is just keep yourself as fit as you can during this campaign when we've got the money we'll do it we'll get it done um, so yeah, we were training quite hard, um, throughout the week doing pretty much long cycles, maybe sometimes six, seven hour cycles on the weekends and then short ones over, over the week after and before work and things like this. Um, and then doing gym and uh, rehab, rehabilitation sort of stretches and stuff that helps open up your back and kind of improve your posture on the bike and things like this. So we were doing a lot of that for six seven months on the lead up to the to just getting the sponsorship but that we just didn't know how long we'd be doing that for because we just don't know we didn't know until like very much the month before that this was going to go ahead so it wasn't like it's happening in june it's like it might happen in june but the government might lock everything up and some sponsors might put out because of the government locking everything up so it was very much like be ready for any moment <laughs> So a bit of a complete head, uh, but, <laughs> but as you, you call, call it. it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It was like, it, it can happen at any point. Let's just be ready for it. <laughs> nice. And because I, I, I watched the trailer um, and it looks incredible. How was it sort of taken at the festival? So Kendall, we had really good feedback. So Kendall Mountain Festival, um, focus on outdoor adventures and sustainability and social social films and we we felt that we were kind of maybe talking to people who are of our who are like our tribe they do a lot of people do similar things to us um trying to highlight environmental awareness campaigns and doing outdoor adventures but trying to be sustainable at the same time so that we had, there was a lot of people there who were very much you know in, in our space and we had some great great feedback saying it was really well done on the tight budget and they enjoyed the film it was both informative and entertaining and adventurous at the same time so that's what we wanted and we wanted it to be a bit thought-provoking and 
a lot of people said they were questioning things that they do and questioning things uh, around them and that 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 was literally the ambition of the film so yeah i i think it it was accepted quite well and we got a good reception uh from there and we also have had discussions with distributors about maybe scaling it up so the film itself when you do watch it it's got six interviews in it we actually shot 26 interviews but we only chose six of the 26 because we only had half an hour to show an entire adventurous journey and fit in interviews at the same time so uh, we're looking to do a series out of it uh, um, an educational series if we can and um, just need to get financial backing for that we've got the footage and the content it's all shot it's just getting it all put together uh, again anyone listening <laughs> come say hi <laughs> good and Another thing I sort of looked at was on your website, you talk about the power of yes. Well, for people listening, can you sort of explain what this message is about? So the power of yes is quite an, an interesting three-letter word because one, it can get you doing things that you really, really enjoy. And then two, it can also take you down the wrong route. So yes can... Yes, can be good and bad at the same time. Um, but I, I find that when you kind of understand the things that you like, really do like, and you're not just doing it for the sake of doing it, and you're not just doing it because it looks cool, because someone said it's cool, or you're not just doing it because you're, you're, you're not just saying yes to it because you've been obliged to say yes to it. You're actually generally thinking, this is something I genuinely like to do, and I really would get a lot out of it. That's a really powerful yes. And that was a yes that I was probably not really doing much when I was in my younger years. So during during um, you know, school and going into university, I was just saying yes to anything that would fit me in a group or w- would get me f- through my education. And it was kind of like, I'm just saying yes because I, I don't really know why I'm saying yes. Why am I saying yes to doing this degree? Why am I saying... It was very much like it's the done thing. You should get a degree. You should do this to these these A levels. And then I realized I really enjoy outdoor sports and green, you know, the green spaces and nature is really good for my mental health. So I just started aligning my life around yeses that supported that. And it's just been really great since. Um, but I wish I knew that a lot long, long time ago. Um so yeah, uh or yeah, saying yes to some things that maybe aren't your thing or isn't something that you really, really would enjoy and it's just you're doing it for aesthetics or you're involved because someone told you to do it. It's not necessarily always the best thing. I know you're in if you're in a workplace, you have to say yes sometimes because obviously you don't get paid if you're not gonna do it. But um there are instances where you can push back and say, no, that's not my thing. Um, but they, yeah, there is a bit of a yes bug like, that you can get from saying yes. And then it can lead to things that you never thought that you would go down. So when I said yes to doing the English channel, I would never really have opened up my eyes to a whole new world of living, a way of living that just... I was in a, such a state mentally and physically just terrible. And I said yes to, and that just changed my life. And it was, it was a simple, simple act that I could have said no to because I'm like, why would I do that? I've always swam in the pool. Or that's way out of my comfort zone. But that opened doors to things. And then I said yes to rowing across an ocean. And then from that, I was able to actually spend 40 days thinking about what I actually cared about. And then from that, I was able to come up with this, and um, big journey and adventure and highlight climate solutions, which are so important and it's a really good purpose. So there was a, there's some really powerful yeses that can come just from your inner, like this, this is right. And then there's can be some yeses, which is stay on the screen again, do this again, do, do the same old, same old again that you don't enjoy. And you just keep saying yes to it. Um, and then you just get more and more, upset about it so there's there's two ways yeah it's just it's quite powerful it's, it's, i think it's one of the most powerful words in the world 
Yeah, I, th- I think what's so interesting about your story is how something so good came from something so selfish in a sense of you decided to do this to benefit yourself, but at the same time, it's beneficial for so much more. Or so, yeah, it was or so people. many more people. Yeah, it, started, it did start off as a selfish thing. The, you know, swimming in the English Channel is like, how do I push myself? How do I get myself out of this mental health state that I'm in? I was just thinking, get me out of this head, basically. That's what I was thinking. I just need something to take me away. So it was very much like that. And then realizing that there's so many other people who are in this boat, same boat, who who could do this sort of of support, it then becomes unselfish because you're then sharing your learning, sharing ways, helping people to do it. You know, one of the guys on this trip, he had really bad mental health and he's now in a better state from doing outdoor challenges with myself and others doing this stuff. Um, it, yeah, it started off selfish and changed. It's just like how you say how you say that, but it's a. Uh, I think it. I think it was. Um, I don't know if it was lucky that it's quite something that helps other people. Otherwise, I would come across as really, really selfish. Um, but I, yeah, I think. I think if I was just pursuing it for money, it would be a different thing, wouldn't it? So, um, I'm you know I'm just doing doing it just to help 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 the world in some way so are you a lot more disciplined now on sort of social media on your phone turning notifications off oh i've got no notifications on my phone (laughs) i i did that four years ago so the only time i'll know if someone's messaged me is if i go into my phone go into the apps and stuff like that so i don't get the buzzes anymore which I used to, because I used to be working, doing something, hiking. And it was like buzz distracts everything. So now it's on my own accord. Um, and with social media, one of the devils of it is it's one of the fastest ways to interact with people. So if you do want to get a message out there, which is to help people in some way, some of the quickest ways you can do that is using social media. So I use it differently to how I used to use it and I use it as a way to spread message it like a like a purpose and a message to get people involved um, and connected with the causes and stuff like that so yeah I use it in that way more than anything else at the minute nice well Isaac it's been such a pleasure listening to your stories yeah thank thank you uh <laughs> for having me on the on the show I hope people get connected and want to want to find out more about how they can get involved in 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 this sort of world well absolutely there's a part of the show where we ask the same five questions to each guest each week with the first being what's the sort of one gadget that you always take on these trips with you the one gadget that i always take on trips and outdoor trips yeah yeah okay so probably some sort of warm clothes like some sort of warm thing because I find that when I'm outdoors all the time, swimming, hiking, yeah, I'm always, I always will get cold. So some, some sort of th- thing to keep me warm, like a warm jumper or something like that. Because even in the summer, you go for, I go for a run, you get the cold sweats afterwards sometimes, and that's not good. So yeah, something like that. Uh, that's not very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's probably like, oh, lucky duck or something. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure uh, what a high-tech jumper is a sort of gadget, I suppose. Yeah, maybe, yeah. <laughs> Maybe something like this, yeah. Okay. What about your favorite adventure or travel book? Favorite adventure or travel book? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm terrible at reading. I I have dyslexia, so it takes me about a million years. I found out when I was very young, reading Harry Potter uh, took me (laughs) way too long. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I do, I do, I read sort of audio books more, so like audio, audio things. And um, the best, the best book that I think I was, I was reading, I was given a long time ago was, um, born survivor from Bear Grylls. He's a bit of an idol. And I don't know if it is actually the book that has inspired me or just him. Um, but I just, I just really like his ethos about doing these adventures and things he does to promote getting young people outdoors and, uh, and pushing boundaries and things like this. I just, I just think it's such a, um, in how do I describe it? 
it's something that's needed more. People like him just getting people ex- inspired to get outdoors like that in, in his way. It, it, it touches people. I think it, it resonates with people and it, yeah, he does it quite well, especially at scale. And that that's really impressive. Cool. And why are adventures important to you? Uh, we sort of covered that over the uh, podcast, but but for the sake of the five questions. Yeah, adventures are important for physical and mental health mainly and get getting that sort of that benefit where I can't get it from anywhere else. Uh, that flow, that state of flow, that feeling of mindfulness, that feeling of in your own head, just enjoying the moment, hearing the birds, just being there. That's why I do it. Nice. Uh, favorite quote? I got a new one. Go on then. Go on then. So at the Kendall Mountain Festival, I watched that 14 Peaks. Yep. Yep. And I love, he says, giving up is not in the blood, man. And I just love that because I've been in so many instances where you just feel like you're so done. I've pushed myself so hard or I'm, or I've been working so late on some projects and I'm just like, no, I can't give up. Let's get this, this done. It's not in the blood. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was from NIMS. But actually, uh, I think another really great quote, if I'm allowed to do two, I took a walk in the woods and I came out taller than the trees. That was a really big one for me. So that quote, that quote was, um, I think his name is Justin, Justin Trio or something like this. Uh, I, if you type in, I took a walk in the woods and I came out taller than trees, you'll find out who wrote that one. Justin Trudeau or Justin Churo? I think so. It might be Trudeau. I, I, if I, I could see if I can get up. Um, As in the Canadian prime minister? No, I don't think it was him. <laughs> It was someone before. I'll try and get up now. It's uh something that I'm not very good at is remembering. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Na- right. Friends and names. It's never been my my thing. But um, yeah, that 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 was really really important for me because that came. Ah, uh, here we go. I've got it completely wrong. Henry David Thoreau. 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 You were close. You were close. Uh, yeah, that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's to Truro. Truro, I thought, was Furro. And um, that, that quote was really important because that was where I started escaping from screen time at university. And I was taking those short breaks in the walk. Um, and that, that, that resonates with me so much. Just breaking up my life a bit with some nature. Okay. And people listening are always keen to travel and go on these grand adventures. What's the one thing that you would recommend to people wanting to get started? Oh, okay. Get started in traveling. And well, it could be an adventure or travel can be anywhere. In in my my view, it could be just outside where you live, or it could be really far flung, get a flight, go, go for a jungle and stuff like this. And I would always recommend using your assets to get the best out of your travel trip. So sometimes it's really nice to just go blindly to places. And then sometimes it's quite nice to have sort of a vague idea where you want to go and what you want to do. And so I I try to advise people, if you have the option to research these areas, please do. You could go blindly uh, down, down the wrong street, or you could go blindly somewhere that could be dangerous that, that if you had researched you would have avoided um so yeah always research uh, where you're going and that you'd be actually really pleasantly surprised what you can research just where you live interesting historical facts his history places in- interesting walkways that you've never thought you'd go to some bits of nature that you couldn't find um before yeah so yeah that's how i advise it just if you can do a bit of research before you go Perfect. And finally, what are you doing now and how can people follow you in your future adventures? Great. Um, so I've just started a community interest company. Uh, we're calling it Climate Explorers. And um, so basically it's just gro- it's growing the, the, 
the campaign, the impact campaign, pedal for parks, but we did the adventure for the cycle and the, the climate solutions. We're looking to scale it up and do a bit more speaking and create other forms of content, other documentaries, series and things like this. So that that's um, what we're working on now. Right now, the, the website is pedalforparks.co.uk, but it's going to change to climateexplorers.co.uk at some point in the near future, but I can't put a time frame on it when it be some point in December. Um, but yeah, that's 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 where you can find uh, out about that. But in the meantime, I have a website that's linked to all of this too, um, isaackenyon.com, and you can find out more about the adventures I've been on, um, some some blogging uh, materials and things like this, uh, videos um, and content uh, in this strain, and a bit more about climate explorers. But yeah, that's what I'm doing now. Amazing. Well, Isaac, it's been such a pleasure and we'll leave a link in the description for Isaac's website and Instagram handle and everything. Thank you very much, John. No Thanks worries. Thanks for your worries. questions. Yeah, they're really great questions as well. I really enjoyed uh, them. Uh, uh, well, thank you so much for coming on and I think uh, hopefully everyone's enjoyed listening to your stories and I'm sure we look forward to seeing you, know, you on your next big adventure, wherever that may be. Cool. <laughs> well thanks well Isaac. thanks Isaac take care well that is it for today thank you so much for listening and I hope you got something out of it if you did hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you in the next video <laughs>